Welcome to our channel. My name is Sarah Seelan and I work in the church office. This Father's Day, we hosted a special panel where we asked our dads the tough questions. We hope you enjoy the message and glean some of their pearls of wisdom. Good morning, guys. Again, good morning. Well, uh, like I said, this morning I started you off with a uh, softball question. This will be another softball question. And when I ask you this, go ahead and answer the question and then tell us who you are and how long you've been married, how many kids you have. Uh, my name is Tony Powers, by the way. Uh, married almost 35 years, and uh, I have four children. I'm married to Jill. And the question to you three is that you're at home, you're relaxing, you're sitting at home, you're watching Netflix, you're playing a video game, or whatever the case may be, and your wife gets up and starts cleaning right in front of you. What do you do? And then answer that question and tell us who you are. <laughs> Pastor Tim? I'm not sure. I don't think he's on. On purpose. What do I do? Oh, what do I do? I move to another room. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Disappear. Uh, anyway, no, you have to get up and get help out. But uh, I'm Pastor Tim, Tim Grace. I've got four kids. What? Say, wow, three kids. And uh, three kids. Thinking about you because you said four kids, so I was copying your answer. Like, how many? Yes, th have? yes three that and, you know uh, about. Yeah. You forgot to mention the drummer today is your son, so Anthony's here today. Uh, you got three boys, all teenagers 13, uh, 15, and 19. And we've been married for t almost 22 years. Awesome. Tim? It's a trap. <laughs> That's my line. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> Sorry. Of course, you get up and help. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because there's no way you can enjoy whatever it is you were watching. <laughs> you Watch your room. Your wife is cleaning. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tim LaFazia. I am the director of music and technology here at Victory uh, and uh, part of Tim Squared. Uh, and just honored to be on the panel. How many kids do you have? Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I have eight children and I've been married uh, almost 38 years now. My turn. Uh, I'm going to get up and help just because I know she probably asked me to do it about four minutes before she started. Uh, it's probably one of those things where she said, all right, if you're not going to get up, I'm going to do it myself. Dang it. Uh, my name is Connor Kester. Uh, I've been married for a year and a half. We'll be married two years in August. Uh, when we got married, we had an instant family. I have uh, two daughters that I got in the package, Sadie and Darby, and we just welcomed our baby boy, Cal, in January. Well, can right, I say one more thing? Yes, please. I just want to say, in introducing ourselves, I am sitting in the place of Gustavo Valderrama Sr., who was supposed to be here today, but he had things to do in Mexico that came up there, dad stuff you got to do, and Connor is sitting, so we were, Connor and I were kind of voluntold, uh, as Connor was sitting in place for Dan Cheer, who uh, work said, you got to come in, and he didn't have, his boss went into the hospital and was like, seriously? That's why you got to? So he's taking his place today as like the father of the newborn today. So uh, they were would have been here. They're excited, but so we're kind of in that voluntold position. All right. So I'm the only first choice. That's right. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. Only right. first okay. choice. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, Connor, I'm gonna start with you. To, uh, start with you this time. Give you the opportunity. You know, so you don't have to say ditto. Yeah. Is that okay? All right. Um, Connor, um, as a Christian. What do you think about the fact that as a father, you are representing the father? Uh, when we talked about this this morning, the word that came to mind is a word that we've discussed a lot. Uh, if you've been with us throughout 2024, uh, and that's stewardship. Uh, we usually talk about it. I think we just talked about it last week. Uh, we usually talk about stewardship as in things, objects, uh, the earth, the buildings that we're in charge of, the church. Uh, but God also calls us to be uh, stewards of our family, to take care of our family, to love our family the way that Jesus loved the church, the way he still loves us. Uh, we had that reading that Tony gave us in Deuteronomy about here's the things that you should do. Here's how, here's how to do it. Uh, there's sometimes we feel lost. Sometimes we don't have an answer that we want to give, but we know that we have uh, a God that we can pray to for the answer, and we have a manual that he gave us on here's what to do if you if you feel lost, but that idea of stewardship to me is what uh, is the idea of representing the Father. Thank you. 
Mr. Lafazio. I, I tend to agree. It is stewardship. Uh, I, th uh, I will kind of roll back to when uh, our first uh, son was born and the uh, just the overwhelming responsibility uh, and weight that I felt on my, my shoulders and on my heart thinking, oh my gosh, God entrusted this life to me. What if I screw it up? What if I don't do the right things? What if I don't say the right things? What if I let him down? And uh, I think that it's important to understand and recognize God's sovereignty, that he is Lord over all things. And he, he was Lord and is over me and over uh, my children and if there's one thing that I've learned in my, uh, my many years of fatherhood and now grandfatherhood, I am going to let you down. I am going to make mistakes. I'm going to say the wrong things. Uh, I'm going to do the wrong things. But God is a God of grace and mercy. And uh, what he's entrusted us to do is to model that grace and mercy. Uh, we are created in his image, and uh, we just need to recognize his sovereignty and do our best, and he's going to do the rest. Thank you. Pastor Tim? Uh, just echoing these two, it's like it's a really daunting task when you think about um, that we are representing the king of the universe. And we're just saying about him, the good, good father, and we tell you he's truly good and perfect in every way. You know, somehow we're representing him. And I've been around long enough uh, in ministry. It doesn't really need to be in ministry to know this, that when, if there's a negative relationship with your dad, it does impact people's ability to even grasp the idea that there's a good, good father. How do I interact with God in that sense? But then, though, as a follower, though, I'm reminded that I'm not perfect, I can't be perfect, but I'm forgiven, and we move forward with that, and then God doesn't leave us alone in that. He gives us kids because he says in some, his wisdom, not mine, his wisdom says, I'm going to trust you with this kid, and as a Christian, I have to look at it like that and go, okay, this is God's kid, he's trusting me with this kid. If I'm not a Christian, it doesn't matter. But now it matters, and I want to be who God wants me to be. And there's that commandment, um, honor your father and your mother. And over the years, I've gotten that question all the time, honor your father and mother. And people will, well, what if? <laughs> if your father's this or your mom's that or they'd make decisions. I, that's why I get a lot from kids. But as a parent... I actually take that, okay, now that kind of means I should be an honorable father. Not perfect, but I should be honorable so that my kids look at that and go, okay, that's an honorable father. You're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to make amends when you need to make amends. You say sorry when you need to say sorry. You do, you model those kinds of things so that they look at you and go, okay, he's doing, as Jesus would say, we're sinful. He's good enough at that. Wow, how great must the Father in heaven be. Well, thank you. That, those are great answers, and I'm going to follow up with that answer with, uh, these are going to be kind of two questions in one, but um, we'll start with you, Pastor Tim, this time. Um, who are your influences as a father, but, and how does that help you become a leader in your home? Hmm. Uh, you flipped those around from first service. Yes, you, I did. Okay, all right. Uh, so how did, my influence for the father is, uh, greatest influence is my dad, uh, an honorable father, uh, definitely not perfect, um, but honorable. Uh, a lot of history with that, of course. And um, the best things that he did was he walked it with me. Um, so that reading we just read, like I choose the readings on Sunday a lot of times. And you shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, and so I chose the one for today. I went through different ones, chose that one, just because it represents so much of my relationship with my dad of when we're going to be out and about, we're going to walk 
when we were out and about, uh, the, I spent most of my time with my mom going from here to there, school droppings off, things like that. But when he had the opportunity in the car rides, the football games, the, the hour long drives, the half hour here, the 30, the 20 minute felt like three hour run that he'd make me go on. We would talk about life, but not just talk about life, but talk about how God intersects with that and how God leads us. And then I take that then and then try to do the same thing with my boys. Um, and then even as a leader in the house, let's pause, let's take a moment. Uh, how do we bring God into the situations? And uh, we're, we're a shared leadership home because I think God created us to, you know, Adam and Eve, they said they're to be helping each other. So there's not hierarchy necessarily. It's just like you've got leadership and to take care of my family and to take care of my family is to remind them who's in charge, who's really taking care of our family, and how do we bring that back together. Uh, and sometimes, though, Amor is the one that does that. When I'm spun out, uh, she'll be the one bringing that in. So we do that together, but she'll really to be a, help per a person to help us bring our focus back into who matters and what matters. Tim? So uh, I have to echo Tim. Uh, Absolutely, hands down, number one greatest influence uh, for fatherhood in my life is my dad. Uh, I just talked to my dad on the way into church this morning. Uh, he's in his 90s. He was uh, in the middle of cleaning his koi pond, uh, <laughs> which he built. Crazy. Uh, uh, and uh, I just needed to thank him for all the wisdom, but mostly the mercy uh, my dad uh, always took the opportunity or seized the opportunity to, uh, to look at every situation as a teaching moment to point uh, me and my brothers and my sisters to our relationship with Jesus. And... Uh, uh, I guess that folds into the second part of your question. Uh, what do I consider to be uh, m like my leadership role, I think is what you were asking. Yeah, and that is to point my family How's to Jesus. How does it help you lead your family? Yeah. So it's definitely, that, that is my, my primary function as uh, the head of our household. And even though I'm the head, uh, Mary Ellen is the neck so she turns my head where it needs to go. Uh, but yes, my fundamental job is to point our family to Jesus. Uh, I'd also say my dad, but I have to start that with my two grandfathers who influenced my dad. Uh, obviously, his dad was great influence, but uh, my mom's dad actually met my dad when he was about 10 years old. So they, they, they knew each other for a long time, and my two grandfathers couldn't be more opposite. Uh, my dad's dad was this uh, big, loud, obnoxious, free-spirited, army vet cowboy. Uh, and my mom's dad was this calm, cool, and collected Hawaiian shirt-wearing Navy chief that was just very soft-spoken. And uh, But both of them influenced my dad, in which turn influenced me, because my dad admitted all the time growing up that he was not ready uh, to be a dad, that when my mom found out she was pregnant, he went and bought every book that he could. Uh, he studied as much as he could until the day I was born, and then in the hospital, they handed me over to my parents and got the discharge papers and said, all right, you're free to go, and my dad looked around and just said, there's no book for that. I'm not ready for that part. I, I know all of this, what to expect when you're expecting, but now it's, now it's this part, but my dad and I's relationship was was tremendous. Uh, my dad's no longer with us. My dad passed away a couple years ago. Uh, but luckily, the influence that, and the decisions he made were actually to put me here into this community. And now all these years later that he's gone, I've gotten to develop relationships with father-like figures. Because no matter how old you are, when, when your dad's earthly life ends, you feel like it's too soon. That's just our, our selfish nature that we want people here. Uh, but luckily, he put me in this community where I've gotten to meet uh, Tim, who is my teacher, 
Pastor Tim, who we started at Pilgrim the same year uh, when, I, when my family moved here, and now we work together every day. Uh, Tony was my coach in high school. He taught me how to shoot free throws, uh, which I still use to this day to show some of the high schoolers how it's done. Um, and I got to meet other people like Scott and Earl and George who have become uh, father figures to me now that uh, my dad's gone. And that's helped me be a leader in my house because I'm just taking everything that I've learned. I've learned a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, my dad's big thing was you're going to make mistakes like we've talked about. Uh, he always talked about his mistakes that he made and that, you know, really just to think about where you come from and who helped you and to pass along that knowledge, which is great to have. Uh, my son around these same men that, uh, since he can't be around his grandfather, uh, but he gets to be around these men that I bring him to see every day, so. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about influence a little bit, and I posed this question in the first service, but uh, uh, Tim LaFazio will start with you this time. Um, because there are so many outside influences, we're going to talk about social media a little bit. How have you been able to navigate, or how can you navigate the influence that social media has on this generation, or this uh, this this the way we live today, uh, how can you bring your leadership and help with uh, navigate that, neg the negative stuff we just Sure. Uh, so the short answer is speak the truth always. And there is only one truth, and that truth is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. And his truth cuts through everything. So, uh, and, and I, uh, I certainly feel for this generation because even though uh, we faced the same kind of barrage of, of lies growing up that uh, it was, uh, our, our worth was according to our material wealth and how we looked and what things we accomplished and none of that is true and when you're teaching your children that really your value solely rests in who you are not what you've done but who you are and that is God's creation nothing else matters you don't have to worry about all that other noise. But uh, as I was saying, there's a lot of noise out there. And for us, it was, it was a bunch of lies through the advertising industry and other places that uh, I'll say came through a garden hose. Now it's a fire hose because of uh, social media. And uh, I promise you that if you're speaking the truth, it will be heard. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, quickly share uh, uh, a story uh, about my, my oldest son, Tim, who uh, is a brilliant individual. Uh, he uh, uh, is also very headstrong. And during his teenage years, uh, our household was tumultuous. It was difficult. Uh, and he had his own opinions about everything, and uh, like typical teenagers, believed that he knew more than, than everybody else, uh, and there were times when I certainly felt like I was failing, uh, but I continued to speak God's truth to him through those times, and when he became a father, uh, just in... Uh, conversation about his his son and and uh who was uh uh coming into his own adolescent years uh tim said to me dad i want you to know that during that period of time when you thought that i didn't hear you i was listening and i remember all of it so don't give up speak the truth to your children. Thank you. Pastor Tim? Uh, yeah, with the social media questions and all the, the information that comes in that um, is all on devices and just feeds right into them wherever they are. You know, our approach to it, and it's 
by the way, it's, it's not perfect because everything is just like, we'll find out if my kids are well adjusted in a few years, right? I have no idea. I think they're good, uh, but we'll see. We'll find out. Um, but they, uh, our oldest, you know, we got his phone. We've been limited very much on when they get one. Um, it's like eighth grade graduation now. Noah got a little bit earlier because he was involved in a club sport. But we kind of said no to the whole social media things. We want to monitor those. And, of course, what does any kid do, you know, whatever, right? They've got it in their pockets so they can maybe sign up for Instagram or sign up for something. <laughs> My wife's got the best question ever, by the way. She's just, all you got to do is say to your kids sometime, so do you have anything you'd like to confess? <laughs> oh, man, they start sweating on that one. And next thing you know, stuff just starts coming out. And you're like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't really even know all that. Uh, but... That was the best day. Uh, that was hilarious. But um, it was one of those kinds of moments where we noticed that there's some negative things happening with him. And so we asked him about it, and I was really proud of him because he recognized it. And so he said, okay, we're saying uh, from the view of himself, the world, all the things, he was getting super upset about things. And, okay, we said, okay, no more. Uh, do you have it? Do you have this? And and he's good. He's a good truth teller because you put the like I said, you put the pressure and he he melts. And yeah, I did okay. Unless we're gonna get rid of this, and he saw it, and he's like he because we talk about these things. We already have established that was what we talk through and talk the bad and the good. He gave it up. He said, no, I don't want it anymore. And then he uh, it wasn't until I think junior year, senior things like really not until senior year that he get. Instagram and Snapchat and those things because it was, we'd ask him, are you ready yet? What do you think? No, I'm not ready yet. He'd actually say, no, I don't want that yet. Until it comes time to sharing information with, because his friends all communicate through these different avenues. And and I want to share funny reels with him too. So I'm like waiting for him to get Instagram so I can share stuff with him. And so that's when it happened. And then we did the same rule again with uh, Micah, not until eighth grade, uh, Isaiah, you're not getting anything until after eighth grade. You know, I don't care if your friends have this or that. It's not happening. And, and the interesting thing on the social media apps, the one who makes the call now for them, Amor and I don't make the call. Noah makes the call. And he says he's not ready for it. And he's stricter than we are. And so he's watchful and protective of saying, nope, he can do this, and no, nope, he can't do it. Hey, Dad, can I watch this show? No, he can't. Okay, and that's all it is. Now, he doesn't get into the whole talking thing. He's like, nope, he's, he's going to be that dad. Nope. Yes, why? Just because. And, uh, but we'll talk through it. And the biggest thing, and the other thing part of it was um, uh, I remember hearing, uh, went to a conference a bunch of years ago, and they were talking about youth work. And the person who was speaking said, at some point during your teenage years, their teenage years, they're going to stop talking to you. Not because they don't love you, they're just going to stop talking to you. So it's good to know who they're talking to, what kind of other adults are in their life. And so I've been thankful that our kids are here and I know who, uh, who they're talking to outside of class. Um, outside of school, outside of our family. And, uh, and when it came to social media and computer stuff, Tim was a big part of that because he was able to show just scientifically to learn about algorithms, to learn how all these platforms are designed to really to not just feed you the same information, but Noah was getting information that made him dissatisfied with his life. And all of a sudden, it was like his YouTube channel was constantly feeding him, like how he is, uh, he loves computers and stuff, and that the PC he had just built, he had just built on his own with the help of my brother-in-law, had just built this thing, it was now suddenly six, less than six months, no good, because he didn't, little things, and he didn't realize that YouTube was just feeding him all this negative information until he had him in class. And it was like, oh, they're manipulating me. I don't want a part of that. And so now he's more controlled about how he does that and then sharing that and then putting it on to, uh, putting it on to his brothers. All right, thank you. Connor? All right.
in our family, we, uh, our kids aren't quite old enough to have, they don't have their own social media. Uh, if anyone with Cal's name tries to follow you on any social media, it's not him. Okay, he's already, he's already been hacked, if that's the case. Uh, but he's more popular than you on social yes, media right now. Yes, he is more popular than me on social media, but I prefer it that way. Um, but for us, our talk in our house is all about uh, guarding your heart and, you know, what you see on, on TV or on YouTube or, or anything like that. Our situation uh, is unique in that we have a co-parent uh, with us. The girls go with their biological father every, you know, every other weekend. We have that kind of that kind of schedule and we just don't have the control that you know of of his house which is he doesn't have control of our house it goes back and forth so we're trying to instill values for them that they take with them uh, but at 11 and 8 years old they kind of just see it as rules and no rules and as a kid no rules seems uh, sometimes seems really good it seems exciting uh, but they're also coming to an age where they're starting to ask a lot of why questions. Why can't I do this? Why can I do this? Uh, and those are the conversations that we're starting to have. So they're starting to understand it, but uh, for the most part, it's all about rules or no rules. And for Erica and I, it's really instilling our values with our time with them. Uh, we do things together. We watch things together and we have conversations about, and eh, we're not going to watch this and here's why. You know, we're, but really our main focus for them when it comes to the internet and things is uh, guarding your heart through what you watch and through what you hear and keeping that focus, as Tim said, on, on your relationship with Jesus. And that's going to influence your decisions uh, when it comes to media and things. Uh, I just want to uh, put a piece of uh, just a nugget out there that I think is important to, to parents and grandparents. Uh, everybody should take a look at this documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. It's about four years old now, but it's still... Uh, on point and incredibly relevant, and it paints a very clear picture of the design of social media and its evil. So uh, I, I do believe that there are components of social media that are a platform that, that can be used for good, but I think you need to understand its architecture so that you are wise about how you're guiding your children or grandchildren. Thank you. As our final question, Connor, we're going to start with you. Um, as a father, what kind of support do you need, particularly from the women in your life? All right, this is the question I said was a trap in That's first. Right. <laughs> it's a trap. Uh, but in all honesty, I, I think of my relationship with, with my wife, who is, who is my best friend. Um, we, when we first started dating and, and the people around us were like, there's, there's something going on between you two. We simply just kept saying that, oh, this is my best friend. Uh, which was never a lie. We always tell people, that was not a lie. This is my best friend, and uh, she continues to be my best friend from, from now and forever. But uh, uh, the thing that I have to keep going back for is, is grace and forgiveness. Um, I get compared to the dog a lot, um, where I'm not malicious in what I do, but man, there are some things that, uh, you know, she, she likes to look at the dog and say, you traded brain cells for beauty, and uh, you get your your brain cells from your dad. And so there's just things that we do as men that we have no idea that, you know, our one step at a time minds are working way too slow uh, for, for the women around us sometimes. But for me, it's always going back to uh, grace and patience because uh, I know that there's things that we talk about with our girls because, like I said, they're at an age where they ask why. Uh, so one night we were talking after prayer time, and, and I was asked the question, uh, I was asked a question by one of our daughters of, why are my parents divorced? And I was like, um, I don't know how to answer that, but I can't say that I'm too upset because I'm married to your mom and now we have Cal and, you know, God has a plan for us. And Erica always prays every night over our girls and, and Cal that uh, she prays, Jeremiah 29, 11, that uh, there are plans for us not to harm us, but to, you know, prosper us and and. But for me, it's keep going back to that and kind of checking my instant emotion of, I don't know what to say, or why are you asking me that? Uh, and she's like, well, they're at an age where they're going to ask why. They're just, everything we say, they're going to ask why. And so uh, her, you know, just telling me, hey, it's okay to not have that answer right now. It's okay to not do that. Thank you. Mr. Bermazio. Uh Absolutely, my, uh, Mary Ellen is my best friend. Uh, and 
she uh, she definitely uh, uh, supports compensates for my my weaknesses. Uh, she is so I, I'm a I'm a problem solver. Anybody who knows me has had anything to do with me. If you walk up to me and you tell me that there's a some kind of an issue that you're facing, I immediately go into problem solving mode and then come back to you with this architecture of how we're going to fix whatever that is. So I'm 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 a fixer. That's that's kind of in my nature. Uh, but not everything needs to be fixed. First of all. Uh, and Mary Ellen is really good at helping me put the brakes on and understand that when our kids come to me with a problem that I don't necessarily have to have the answer. I just need to be pointing them to Jesus and we need to be praying for them. So she is really good at putting the brakes on and I need that from her. Uh, the other thing she's really good at is uh, her BS meter is way better than mine. <laughs> So I, you know, I, I can remember when the when the kids were in in high school, and I would go pick one of them up at a at a party and bring them home, and they'd take one one foot in the door, and she'd say, "You've been drinking," and I was like, I was in the car with her the entire ride home, and I didn't even notice. How did she do that? <laughs> Uh, the other thing that uh, I need from her, and she's really good uh, at, is uh, is helping me be in the moment uh, that we're in instead of focused on, on other things. In fact, uh, just recently, I'd say over the last month, uh, she'll share her, her something with me, like her day, and then she'll quiz me <laughs> when she's done, <laughs> just to make sure that I have been paying attention. Uh, but the the single most important thing that I need from her and I get from her on a regular basis is uh, her prayer and her support. So, thank you, Pastor Tim. Uh, this is a funny question we had because I asked the question. Uh, I put this question in there, and because after Mother's Day, Becky gave us a uh, here's husbands, here's how you can support the women in your life. I'm like. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. We need to ask that for the panel, uh, not realizing I'm a sitting in a seat. And uh, it was like that trap kind of question that uh, Connor said. But to me, when I look at my wife and I look at the women around us, um, just from our experience together, we've had highs, you've had lows, you've been all over the spectrum with things. And, uh, and somebody recently told me that uh, having teenage boys or having teenagers, being the parent of teenagers, is the worst ever. Uh, because, like Tim said, they're butting heads, you know, like that. Like, sleepless nights with a baby who can't go anywhere and talk back to you. Okay. All right. That's, <laughs> that's rough now, but well, now I'm old and I just don't sleep at night. And so that's just that's that fact. It doesn't ever change. But... Uh, but you go through things together. You're going to have differences of opinion of how to handle things and how to do things. Uh, we're both strong-willed people. Uh, she's more vocal. I'm more silent, but we're stubborn about it. And so we can butt heads about things, um, have discussions about things. Uh, and I think and it's true with every married couple that you get to see you have the person you married and the person you know and the person you see their flaws. And when you're in times of conflict, you tend to look at flaws and you look at things like that and what can be done better. And, and it's, by the way, it goes both ways in this. And I think the best thing to do is to start to help get to flush that out is one, we already know, focus on who, pray to God first, Invite him in first. Invite him into the middle of everything. Holy Spirit, flush it all out. And then love the person next to you. And for me, it's like appreciation, to appreciate the person, not focusing on the negative, but appreciate the good, the why you married. 
she's my biggest champion. She's, and, and, and like just now, right before the service, I'm laughing because she's picking stuff off my shirt. And I'm like, like, get rid of my shirt. But you matched clothes today just for me? Did you do that on purpose? Look at you. We're matching. And uh, I don't know. And I just noticed. And uh, but she'll pick stuff off my shoulder. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? You know what I mean? And I'm like, why does she do that? Because she wants me to look good. And she wants good things for me. And I want good things for her. And to remind ourselves of that and to really appreciate one another. And so, like, when I do change the toilet roll, celebrate that. You know, when you do things, the, the many thing, like, when we do clean, we do finally wake up and get off the couch after five minutes. We, we, we're joking. Men joke all the time that we expect to be celebrated, but that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a big deal to us to remember things sometimes. It's a big deal. But to appreciate, to appreciate one another in it is a big deal. Well, what would you guys think? Thank you. Thank you for the guys. We'd like to thank the three of you for coming up and sharing your thoughts. And uh, that was good.